the topic is how to turn leads into sales through effective buyer journey marketing. I want to start with looking at different models today. We'll all have come across different things in our careers. A lot of it really complex and confusing. And so just to introduce the reason for my existence, the reason for B2B Jade as a person on the internet is to reduce the complexity and help you to bring in the basics that you may have been struggling with. If you're here and you already are a super expert in buyer journey marketing, marketing as a whole, you may only get reminders of what you already know today. However, I am also going to share some really cool resources that you can look into further, because if you want to go into much more depth, you really can. What I've created for you is a workbook to create your own simplistic buyer journey if you don't have one already, or a model that you might tweak and adapt to the existing one you already have. Now, we have to start with looking at the classic sales funnel. And one of the models that gets talked about a lot is Tofu, Mofu, and Bofu, which basically means top of the funnel, middle of the funnel, and bottom of the funnel. And basically looking at what should we be doing at each stage of that sales funnel. There are articles dating back to literally 2015 that tell us that the sales funnel is dead, that nobody buys linear anymore, and that is utterly pointless as an exercise. Now, I am never one for absolutist advice. I think that it's valuable to understand that we need to do different things at different stages of these funnels, of these journeys that our buyers go on. The fact of the matter is people do go on a journey. So there's some extra reading for anyone who wants to learn more about Tofu, Mofu and Bofu. But the idea is that at the top of the funnel, we're trying to reach people who don't already know us. We're trying to pull them into our funnel so that we can nurture them, communicate with them, move them through the funnel, maybe ramp up our approach to how we talk about ourselves versus talking about their problem. So a nice little stat that I heard in the past was that at top of funnel, we should pretty much be talking 100% about the problem or pain point that our ideal customer faces. Middle of funnel, you can start to bring in a bit of solution focused talk and a small amount of brand focused talk. So you've got problem, solution and brand. And what that means is the problem is completely divorced of us. Solution is a bit about what they might do to help themselves with the problem. And thirdly is how we then come into the picture on that. As we move through middle of funnel, we can start to ramp up how we talk about solution and start to increase how we talk about our brand ourselves. And at bottom of funnel, it really moves into, okay, 100%. Bang, here's case studies of what we've done in the past. Here's exactly how our service works. Because at that stage, people are ready to talk about those things. The problem happens when a lot of companies are stuck in bottom of funnel across all their marketing. So you go on the website and they're just talking about themselves, their services and what they do. They're not addressing pain points. They're not nurturing in any way. This is why I do think that understanding the sales funnel is important for companies who haven't yet adopted modern progressive marketing because it's somewhere to start. But again, a couple of further reading links in there when you get this presentation after the webinar. And then looking at the classic buyer journey, you've got the ADA model, which is awareness, interest, desire, action. Here I've called it awareness, interest, consideration, action. Sometimes it's three stages, awareness, consideration, decision. It's ultimately the same thing. Typically, ADA talks about people's journey with us, whereas I tend to talk about it in terms of their journey of in, within themselves. What journey are they on? In awareness stage for me, how I talk about it. Now, you can always play around with models yourselves as a marketer. It doesn't matter how you do it as long as you get to the right place. So for me, awareness is at the, the point in time at which they recognize they have a problem or they become aware of a pain point. This might not mean it's when they become aware of us, it's that they become aware of their problem or pain point. We could actually be the people who make them aware of that pain point. A lot of marketing is about making people realize that there's a solution to a problem they didn't even realize was bugging them. That can be a really interesting way to think about buyer journey marketing. How are we going to make them aware of us, but also how are we going to make them aware that they don't have to suffer with something that they've been suffering with and that there is a better way? When we move into interest stage, 
we're looking at the place where they're exploring the options and solutions that are available to them. This could be any number of partners, any number of solution providers. It can also include doing nothing. I'm interested in exploring my problem, understanding it a bit more and figuring out if there's a solution. Oh, right. Okay. It looks like it's going to be really complicated. None of the people out there are giving me any useful advice. It's going to be easier just to stick with it and just suck it up and deal with the pain of the problem. This is really interesting stage because we want to be piquing their interest in us. We want to be being the partner who is adding the most value, helping them solve the problem in their mind, not necessarily selling ourselves, but just helping them see and break down the complexity of what it is they're going through and recognize that you should make a choice and it should be us. When we move into consideration stage, and again, there's so many different buyer journey models, like this is just one of the most common ones. Consideration is when we compare options, when they compare options, and then when they regroup with fellow decision makers. Do not quote me on the exact number here, but there's a really cool piece of data that I think I found on Forrester that said that on average, every decision maker or influencer involved in a large B2B purchase will use, will bring four or five pieces of information or content they themselves have sourced related to their role and how this problem affects them. And so if you imagine that there's six or even 10 decision makers coming together in an organization and the collation of all of that data, all of those six people with five pieces of data each, that's 30 pieces of content, to get through and all these different needs. So consideration stage is really about condensing all of that into one place and making sure that people have see a clear path toward making a decision. And then action, simply select, selection of partner or abandoning the purchase process, just deciding we're not gonna do anything because that's an action too. So this buyer journey, Ada, a lot of it gets a lot of hate and it's like, oh, it's dead now. It's not linear. And the thing is, yes and no. So let's look at a model that is a bit more progressive and modern. The James Watts flywheel is based in history. It was an engineering model, but marketers have since brought it into the brand and nurturing process. The idea here is that because it's not a linear process and sales and marketing and operations all combine and come in and out of the interaction with people. And when you reflect on how people buy today, it's not linear. It literally isn't linear in that in the past, you had a very simple process. Now, I remember 2005. It's when I started in B2B SaaS sales. I was selling a product. I had to get demos and sales. And it was extremely linear. We would cold call a person. They would be usually open to speaking to us because they had no other way to access information other than to speak to me as a consultant. Then I would send them a, an email template to explain our product, why it was better than Dun & Bradstreet, why it was better than Equifax and our other competitors. And then I would follow up to get a demo. I would do the demo and then I would follow up, close the sale. They had nowhere else to look. I'm serious here. When I left school, you had to go to the library to get information. That, that is literally how it worked. And so they had to have that linear journey. They didn't have another option. However, B2B buyers buy like consumers today. If you think about how you buy, sometimes you could run through the whole process, jump back and forth, jump a few steps forward and just buy immediately. You found everything you needed. The price is right, bang, paid, done. Other times you do follow that linear journey. I've had customers who have found me on TikTok, listen to my whole podcast, come to two or three webinars, ask me about my service and then become a client. That's my linear journey that I've designed as my strategy. But I've had others who just found me on my website, signed up for a, a session with me and then were like, oh, I saw you do webinars too. Could I hop on one? So it's really interesting that the stuff I created in order to help people along that journey, actually customers were doing afterwards as well. And so it all kind of like mixes up. That's why this wheel is really useful. It's that attract, engage, delight process. And that's on a continuous cycle. Once you've got a customer, you have to keep doing that. And it's not just marketing and sales that are involved in that. I mean, how frustrating is it when you have a brilliant salesperson, they close you, and then you have a terrible experience with operations or onboarding is dreadful and you don't have that delight factor. And there's links within the template that you can download. 
if you're listening on the podcast or YouTube in the future, that will be in the show notes to get hold of this presentation. You can look at the links provided to give you a lot more information about how the flywheel works because it's very forward thinking. It's a very big piece to understand. But what I particularly liked was this idea of the four stages of strangers, someone who's not aware of us yet, prospects or lead customers and then promoters how can we turn customers into promoters as part of our bio journey as well something that's really interesting to me and so in terms of then versus now it was this idea that in the past or the fact that in the past the funnel was marketing do their job in attracting people in and then sales do the rest of the job in educating and nurturing and then there's a customer whereas now it's this wheel this flywheel of attract, engage, delight in order to lead to continuous growth and turning strangers into promoters. What do we mean by promoter? We mean a customer who has seen that we do a great job and is willing and confident and wants to promote us to others. Why do we need a nurture path at all? Why is it so important in B2B? You'll have to forgive me, but the diagram I'm sharing on the screen is from 2018. But look, this trend will only have increased, I imagine. So it's not like I'm showing something that's no longer going to be at all relevant. If anything, it's going to be more relevant. When it comes to new customers, only 5% of B2B companies have got a less than one month's sales cycle. The highest is four to six months at 28% of buyers. And then more than 12 months is a fifth, 18.1%. That's still a lot of people. So that's why it's so important for us to focus on the buyer journey. I have noticed that marketers in B2B are so obsessed with getting hold of sales leads that they're forgetting this whole piece on what comes afterwards. It's being left entirely to sales or the directors, which is a massive missed opportunity this is the time when we can really make a case among our prospects as to here is why you should choose us, us over the other options available through great brand positioning, through great content. And it doesn't have to be about moving mountains. I know that everybody here has engaged with my content because you want to see a more simple approach to marketing. You're tired of the overwhelm of all the different models. I'm only showing you this stuff as background because I think it's useful to think about and so having a nurture path can reduce that sales cycle length. It can also reduce how many people abandon cart in a sense. So in B2B, deciding not to buy anything at all, deciding to stay where they are. And then just to share an example of how just how complex buying journeys can be, I really like this graphic from Gartner because it shows the ADA model. It shows this linear approach. And we're not going to get into the complexity of all the different things here. But what I love about this diagram that's got all different things going on back and forth around cycling is that it shows that whilst, yes, people are right, the journey is not linear anymore. I would like to argue that it is linear, but we can move forward, backwards, around as fast as we want. And so unless you're in a big tech company with 500 salespeople, a product marketing team of 50 and a marketing team of 70, you really are going to want to keep it simple. And I suggest keeping your process linear while recognizing that people won't use it in a linear sense and then using data to understand how they're really using it, making things multi-purpose. So if you're going to host a webinar, maybe it can be valuable to customers as well. There's no reason why it can't. It's just being confident and conscious of what we're talking about and who it's going to be valuable to and what stage they really are at when they're consuming content from us. And then just a few other stats before we go into the demo. There's a fact here that says nurtured B2B leads generate 47% larger purchases than non-nurtured. Again, if you just have a lead come in and then it gets sent to sales and you're not involved again, they just deal with everything, then they're going to lead to lower purchases and it's going to be 33% more expensive to do it that way. At least 68% of B2B businesses have not identified their sales funnel. Why is this a good thing? Well, it's a good thing because it probably means that a lot of your competitors haven't done it successfully. And so then if you decide to do it and optimize and have really good buyer journey marketing, you're going to be ahead of your competitors, ahead of your competitors. 
68% of B2B customers are lost due to perceived indifference or apathy. I love that. It's like, like, it doesn't make any difference to me, like whoever's cheapest then, because you're all the same, or we're not going to do anything because I can't really seem to find someone who's going to take my headache away. And that is a marketing issue. If sales are not managing to get these things across, we need insights from marketing as to what the clients care about. 82% of buyers think sales representatives are underprepared. Brilliant. A lot of sales reps these days are stuck in 2008 where they had to do the whole journey. They're not used to buyers coming in pre-educated. They're not used to listening anymore to really finding out exactly what people want at point of dealing with a sales or product person. That is such an interesting stat to read more about and talk to your salespeople about. 63% of customers need to hear a company's claim three to five times to believe it. And this is why the mantra when it comes to content marketing is repeat, repeat, repackage, repeat. People get scared to say the same thing over and over. They get scared. They want to change content theme all the time. I would argue that you need two or three content pillars, as in he is the main things we talk about ever, a link to our brand positioning, our main brand's message, why we're different, and just recycle, return, come up with different angles. For example, in my marketing for eight years, all I have ever, ever, ever talked about is here's why you need a strategy if you want results from your marketing. And I go into subtopics like here's how to create a budget. Here's how to manage a budget. Here's how to identify ideal client personas. It's all linked to why you need a strategy. We need to be able to get our message across to people several times in a row in order for them to really believe us. And we need to prove it too. Customer referrals account for 54% of all B2B leads. I mean, that's so cool, isn't it? Just thinking about the fact that referral marketing still exists I think a lot of people want to believe that it's only online now and there's no network and there's nothing else it's just get leads find new people but actually existing customer marketing and getting referrals reviews is a really big part of it 90% of b2b buyers don't go down a linear sales funnel path interesting we've already talked about that doesn't surprise me at all but the problem is most B2B companies are treating them as if they are. Oh, you read our blog and you visited our website four times and then you joined our webinar, which means you are ready to be closed. Hi, will you have a demo with me, please? Uh, I don't want a demo. Um, why? You've been on our webinar. You've downloaded three guides. B2B companies think people are on a linear journey when they aren't. Maybe they're just needing help and they're in a two-year contract and they're not going to be in the market for another 18 months maybe they they're just interested in the topic they're not ready to buy b2b companies with 100 to 500 employees involve an average of seven people in decision making that's huge that's so many people in a room so many people bringing information as to the problem they face in regards to this purchase and meeting all their needs can be really tricky. But again, we don't want to overcomplicate that. There could be things in common between the chief finance officer and the operations director. We just have to map out in our ideal client personas and buyer personas what they care about. And again, if you don't already have my B2B buyer persona workbook, you can get that through the link on all my different channels, TikTok, Instagram. You just click, get the free template. Lastly, 59% of B2B buyers are millennials, putting them in the majority for the decision-making role. Why this is so interesting, and this may not be this year, so this has probably grown as that number will grow every year. Why is that important? Well, millennials buy a little bit more similarly to how B2C buyers buy. We've really seen how the internet has en enabled us to get information that we need, where we've kind of lived through both worlds of networking and also the rise of online. And so that's only going to go up. And then Gen Z is going to start to go into that pile soon. And Gen Z are entirely different again. So for more data on that, just click on the link in the template or in the show notes and you can read a lot more. OK, so how are you going to use this template? Once you've got hold of the template, you are going to empty the example text that I'm about to demo and you're going to edit the department names for your business. For example, with the template I'm about to demo, I've done a journey for the marketing team, a journey for the sales team, and a journey for the operations team as to what they would do during different stages of the buyer journey. 
you could decide to have a product team journey. You could decide to have a customer services team journey, whatever is relevant to your business. And again, this is a really basic starting point for you just to get you going. If anyone's got questions about how to go another level further, feel free to ask. But I think it's good for everyone to start at least with something like this. First of all, in this template, you want to start with understanding what actions are you going to want them to take. I've kept it so simple. None of the language is fussy. There's no jargon. This should not confuse you or scare you in any way. So the different stages, stranger, contact, lead, customer, promoter. Stranger is obviously awareness stage. What action do we want them to take? You need to decide this for your business. For this example, I've put, we want them to become aware of us. We want them to give us their data. We want them to join some kind of online community. So in, in today's world, there are people in my online community on TikTok. I've got coming up to 12,000 followers. There are many of those people who are in my community who are regularly commenting on my stuff who I know, but I don't necessarily have their details. I'm not necessarily marketing to them, but they're in my community. So we're not being too rigid around. They only move to the next stage and they're not a stranger anymore. Once we have their data, there are big debates around data when it comes to gating content or not gating content, i.e. if you have a useful lead magnet, shouldn't you just give it away and assume that people will come back to you if they found it valuable and they consume more of your content and they're in your community? It's like, yes and no. I want to own the audience. In B2B, when we have limited resources, if there's a way that we can own the audience, I think it's great. The problem comes in when people have a website and it's just about us, about us, about us download our portfolio or download our lead magnet and there's nothing being given away before that to make someone actually want to engage with that piece of content and so they're kind of diving straight into dinner before they've even asked someone out it's kind of like that and we need to have a good balance for example you'll notice hubspot one of my favorite marketing examples they give you a ton of stuff without you ever having to give your data but when it comes to downloading a template or having a really interesting report, they will ask for your data at that point. And I think that's clever. Once someone is no longer a stranger, they've become a contact. So I like to include contact. I don't think myself, it goes stranger lead. I think contact sits in the middle. You can have 6,000 contacts in your CRM system, people who have joined a webinar, people who have downloaded a report, people who have just given us their data for whatever reason. We've met them at a trade show, for example but they're not necessarily a lead. They may not be in the market. They may not be ready to buy. And we do not want to have our sales team feel that we're giving them low quality leads because we're like, they're not leads, they're contacts. And so this can really help you to make sure that your sales team are coming in at the right point and not kind of screwing up the work that you've done because you've worked really hard to get someone's contact details and you don't want them hounded by sales straight away. What do we want our contacts to do or the people who are now in our community, anybody who is engaging with us, who likes us, who has given us their data or is involved with us in some way? Mihaela says, give away your secrets, sell the implementation. I adore that. Such a great message. And when we're at contact, what do we want them to do? We want them to, let's say, join our webinars. So they're now aware of us. They've been interacting with us. We want them to join our webinars, as an example. We want them to listen to our podcast, become a binge listener, be waiting for the next episode to come out. We want them to consult our experts with no strings. We want them to feel like we are someone that they could come to if they have a problem. And this is why, particularly on TikTok, you're seeing the rise of subject matter expert and personal brand leading B2B. So a person being the face of a company, a great guy called Chris Walker of Refine Labs. He's the owner and CEO of the business, but he's live on TikTok regularly asking, answering questions, providing subject matter expertise, consulting. He hosts the webinars. He is the face of the business and he's giving advice to people. So they feel they can go to him and say, hey, Chris, how does demand generation work? How does this work? How does that work? And he's just giving them advice. He's not saying, oh, well, if you sign up to this, you'll get this. He's just saying, hey, here's what I would do. And the idea is then people fl people flock to you. They want your help. They want to pay you over someone else who isn't doing that. 
We want them to consume our content. We want them to read our emails, obviously. Once they become a lead, as in there's someone who are like, this person's hot, you know, and within lead, there's a whole journey. It's like, they seem like someone who would be open to hearing from us all the way through to they have had a demo and we're in the later stage of closing them. What action do we want them to take? We want them to agree to a demo or an intro meeting. We want us to choose us as the ones to move forward throughout each stage of the competitive process. And we also want them to invite us to submit a proposal. I really need a sip of coffee. That's always so awkward. You don't want anyone to hear the sound of you drinking. It's such a cringe noise. Okay. Once they've become a customer, we want them to select us as, as a supplier. Fantastic. We also want them to successfully onboard as a client. We're going beyond even, you know, we're not just stopping at lead and, and close. We're also caring about the customer stage as well. We also want them to provide us with the info that we need in order to do a really good job for them. So how often have we brought in a customer <laughs> and then they haven't given us what we need in order to do our job well? And that can be really frustrating because it's like, we can't do what we promised to you without you keeping up your end of the bargain. And with that comes a lot of communications. And I'll show examples in a minute within the template. Next, we reach promoter stage, this idea within the flywheel of not only their customer and they've agreed to work with us, but they actually would recommend us, would write a view about us, would buy additional products, will continue to renew with us. Keep that in mind when you're mapping out the next slides. This is an example marketing buyer journey. I've kept it simple on purpose. I'm a big believer in having fewer marketing activities than more. And look, you just need to come up with what's going to work for you. So the marketing buyer journey, when you've got a stranger, okay, we do organic LinkedIn. We're going to do pay-per-click advertising, making sure our landing pages are epic, that we're giving away loads of great content. We're going to focus on SEO this year, and we're going to do some LinkedIn ads to support getting more people in. Maybe we're going to buy some data. There's so many things that you can do in activities, but I've picked just a few to make sure that we're not biting off more than we can chew, because I know that a lot of you guys do not have never-ending resources. In terms of content, we're going to be doing a blog that goes live every two weeks. It is not going to be just a random blog that marketing have come up with on their own. We're going to consult our subject matter expert for insights that a professional copywriter can turn into a really valuable piece of content that's informed by the pain points of our ideal client. So blog is not about, oh, we do a blog every two weeks, but it's not getting any traction. I'd rather you did one blog every eight weeks that was high value versus every week where it's low value just to get a number of blogs out. We're going to use short form video. The subject matter expert is going to give really useful tips and we're going to promote that across LinkedIn whatever it is, Instagram, TikTok, we're going to give valuable advice that will encourage people to take a bite and take a leap into our brand and understand a little bit more about us. We're also going to have a lead magnet. Now, again, some people can't stand the term. I love the term. If there's something valuable for someone to download and give you their data, fantastic. But make sure that you have a lot more free stuff around that. You're not just going straight into asking them for the lead magnet. In this template, there's a really nice description of where is the person at, you know, just getting in our minds. Where are they right now? When they're a stranger to us, where's their head at? Maybe they're thinking our projects aren't well run and we're inefficient in our service delivery, but how can we change this? They're stuck, they're struggling. In contact, we're going to do email marketing and retargeting. We're going to promote our monthly webinars. We're going to publish a podcast every week and we're going to create quarterly high value reports we're going to use all these things to get in front of these people to try and turn them into leads where are these contacts at in their head at this stage of their buyer journey they're starting to realize that there are some options out there to help them with their problem i'm a little bit confused though is how they're feeling once we can manage to get them into lead we're going to use emailing. We're going to do some maybe direct mail. I am really interested in the role that direct mail is going to play going forwards. Hardly anyone's doing it. I think it's a great opportunity to get high quality materials in front of people and have them physically see something in their hands instead of it being emailed. I think it's a great way to go. This is just an example. What content do we need? Well, okay, so where are they at? There are so many options here. My colleagues have such different needs. Should we just keep things the way they are? That's where their head is at. So we need case studies. We need to demonstrate problem, solution, how we helped, infographics that 
break down complex processes to make them feel like it is worth making the decision and doing something. And then hopefully the something being with us. And remember a lot of the time, the battle, the battle is about how to encourage them to even make a choice at all. And then based on the fact that you're more likely to be doing that than your competitors, they likely choose you in the end, as long as you've got good brand positioning and can clearly differentiate why you're the better option. Maybe some helpful guides, maybe some product guides at this stage, getting the product team involved if that's your bag. And then once they're a customer, okay, what are we going to need? Onboarding forms and net promoter score survey template. We're going to need blogs that just keep nurturing them and keep educating them and making sure, you know, they can still, this is the idea with the bio journey not being linear is like, they can still take value from stuff that we're producing video education, making sure that they're educated in order to get the best from your service is such a big thing in turning customers into promoters, training videos. So where's their head at right now? Once they've become a customer, they might be thinking, I'm really pleased. I found a great partner. I'm scared in case it was the wrong choice. And just a sales pitch time will tell remembering that these people are human. And then once we get to promoter, we are going to maybe do some review marketing, seeing if we can get reviews from them, referral campaigns, encouraging them to introduce us to people. And this is where sales, marketing and operations can all work together for the sales being more direct. Hey, can you introduce me to anyone who might benefit from this marketing, doing campaigns around that? And so education guides for retention, upsell guides, all these materials, all these you know customer stories maybe. And so at promoter stage, when they're in that place of like, I love these guys, they might be thinking, I'm so happy the proposal has worked in execution. I'm telling my friends all about this. And so that flywheel just keeps turning. There's no end line. Let's keep them and let's try and get more people into this cycle. And you can do one of these for each department. Just really quickly, this is the sales buyer journey. I've just talked about the fact that at just stage the pain point for them or rather where they're at it should say is they don't enjoy hearing from salespeople. they never leave me alone I'll find them when I need them that's where their head is at and so if the sales team are going to have activities like LinkedIn sales navigator posting on LinkedIn networking events referral intros email you know emails sending out emails cold calling whatever it is they have to keep that in mind and so they have to have materials that are born from marketing's strategy and insights not just hi would you like to work with us but thinking about the long game of like hi if you're dealing with this problem here's a really useful guide that could help you always on hand if you need a chat it's just like leaving the ball in their court and so then when we get to contact it's like yeah at the right time there's no reason why you can't have a soft phone call from one of your sales representatives as long as they know that the goal is not to close them it's to really just touch base and like understand case by case hey they joined a webinar I'd like to give them a shout because they asked a really interesting question and I'd like to consult them a little bit more so you can look through all of this in your own time once we get towards lead and customer it's like how do we hand over if we've had a great experience with this person they love us how do we make sure that they continue with that experience and they don't feel abandoned by the salesperson once they're a promoter okay I'm the sales director or sales manager how do I check in with existing customers to follow up on any intros they might have for us how do I keep that relationship going how do I make sure with operations they're still happy ready for when I want to upsell them or renew them it's just keeping that interaction but obviously being conscious and careful that we don't end up all of us at them you know marketing want to be sending out regular nurturing stuff and sales touching base as and when and you need systems in your crm to be able to guide and advise on this and then lastly i've just given an operations buyer journey example where they're not going to be involved when it's stranger contact and lead but when it comes to customer maybe at the lead stage maybe they would be attending later sales meetings because if they're operations they're going to be involved in execution of the strategies and the plans presented so they'd need to be there but in terms of where these people would be at in the context of operations maybe when they're a stranger to the business they're thinking well the service I get is okay with the company I currently use but it could be better or I'm nervous to trust partners that they're going to do what I promise I'll need them to demonstrate proof and real examples when it comes to customer they will be doing the onboarding sessions building relationships handing over from sales so there they're going to need things like maybe a training animation maybe video explainers, maybe a full onboarding guide that can be emailed out 
to customers and really working together as departments to help with that. So that is today's presentation. You can also then insert whichever department you want into the template. And yeah, I hope that that was useful to you. And we're gonna jump into questions now. Okay, first question, Eleanor. On the content pillars, how many core pillars and themes would you suggest having? We rely on subject matter experts to help write content who aren't within the marketing team. So sometimes don't see the value and there's a bit of a bottleneck with content. Yes. So on the content, first of all, content pillars and themes, you want to have two or three content pillars. So here are the three things we talk about in general. And then underneath that, you can have themes linked to each one of those content pillars. I would start with having three themes under each pillar and start with three pillars. So you've got 15 themes in total or even 10, five under two, whatever. That enables you to make sure that you are only ever talking about things that are genuinely of interest to your audience and like married to what you sell because what's really common is that people become too audience led and they end up only talking about what they think their customers are going to care about hearing on about and I know that sounds a bit weird but you shouldn't be talking to customers about what they care about only it should be linked with your differentiators and why you're great it shouldn't just be what they're interested in you see it all the time you see a B2B company who's an engineering company, but they're talking about like this huge, you know, zero emissions policy by the government, but it's nothing, it's completely divorced from what they actually do. It makes them sound intelligent and maybe the information is useful, but it doesn't make people feel more confident in them and their service. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, in dealing with subject matter experts, the best way that I have found this to work is to have a content plan in advance and then have the copywriters, ideally strategic copywriters who understand how to lay out a strategic article or piece of content that is directly linked with your content pillars and themes. And then they just interview the subject matter experts. They'll be like, okay, well, I'm getting what I need for the next four pieces I'm writing. Can you put an hour in your diary, please? I need to interview you to get the subject matter expertise. Then all you have to do is get the person to commit to time in the diary for the copywriter to get the information they need. When you ask them to write things down, it just always gets pushed back. But if you get time in their diary and try and cover as much as you can, that's gonna be the best way. Rebecca is asking, how would you demonstrate the value in growing and marketing to our contacts? My sales team seem to really struggle to see the value in putting attention to these people. Right. Okay. So I guess your sales team are like, let's just focus on leads. All we want is leads. We don't care about contacts. Yeah. Well, something interesting that you can tell them is that 85% of people who are in our market, who could be buyers of ours, are not in the market at any one time. It could be even higher, but 85% sounds pretty high. If you research it, it's probably higher. So if we're keeping people educated, warm, nurtured, if we're being the people in their mind, throughout that journey before they're in the market they're more likely to choose us it's undeniable and I had a really bad example of this recently a company reached out to me to say hey Jade your podcast is really good there was no personalization just like the b2b marketing gap podcast is really good full stop <laughs> would you be interested in having a short call with me to discuss how we can produce it for you so that it saves you time and money I mean it wouldn't save me money because I would be paying them but whatever and I just replied to say, hey, thanks so much for reaching out. I'm glad you like the podcast. I'm pretty happy just hacking my way at the moment. You know, once it grows, I'll, you know, I can always get back in contact. And he was like, okay, great. You know where we are if you ever need us. That name is completely immediately gone from my mind. I will never remember who it was, you know, nice enough chap. I'm never going to remember him. And what he could have done was he could have been nurturing me. If he'd invited me to a webinar for podcasters to say, here's some really quick things you can do to make your podcast really great. Once you're ready for the next step is how you can up your production game. It's pretty difficult to do yourself. If you ever need help, you know where we are. Feel free to ask us anything. If they were just there all the time to support me as a podcaster, obviously I would choose them in the end. But what's going to happen now is because no one's doing that to me, Everyone's just cold emailing me. Hi, do you want me to edit your podcast for you? No one, I haven't got a great perception of anyone. 
So I'm just going to have to Google who are the best podcast editors, ask around my network, my friend, Jess, she's got an amazing podcast. It's edited to a high standard. I'll just ask her. And that, again, that's where that whole referral marketing thing works. So missed opportunity. Michaela says, our biggest issue is deciding what is the magic threshold to transfer leads to sales. What evidence or proof of interest is enough for sales? Sales is claiming that leads are unresponsive and therefore kill the opportunity in CRM. They give up too soon. Okay. And this really comes down to your system and having a lead scoring mechanism within your CRM. If your CRM is not strategically set up, I would recommend hiring a CRM consultant. I work with a fantastic one. If you ever need his details, he's incredible at making sure that everybody is aligned and that is strategic. You have to decide in the system what triggers them to move into the next stage. And then I think it's also about really reviewing the insight within that. So sales then need to take a, a judgment call. I think if their approach to how they how they approach leads. So you set up the system that says, look, once someone has done X, Y, Z, they do get moved into the potential for being a lead. And then we suss them out. So this might be more of a nurturing call. And a lot of companies I've worked with have actually just used tele-nurturing partners for this rather than wasting sales time in thinking it's a lead and finding out if it's a lead and then feeling frustrated because naturally a salesperson is going to want to be using their time to get demos or, or meetings. What you can do is have a call where it's like, hi, I'm calling from vision recruiting, whatever. And we were so pleased that you joined our recent webinar and we can see you've downloaded a guide. We just wanted to check in and see if there's anything at all that's been going on with you guys that we could help you with. How is everything going? Oh, brilliant. No, that's great. You're with the, a, a partner right now. I've heard good things about them. You know, if you ever need anything, you know where we are. We'll check in again in a few months, see how you're getting on. By the way, our next webinar is coming up on this date. And also I'll ping you an email with a few different resources and that way you update the system. Okay, they're staying at contact. They're not a lead yet, but we've used a softer approach. I think that could help you. I love the direct mail tactics. Seems tricky to implement though. Oh yeah, let me know how so. Because I mean, I guess it's just about the print cost and then actually posting out. But yeah, I can, because <laughs> that's how my career started because we only really had direct mail back in 2009. With thousands of marketing tools out there, it's overwhelming to develop a functional effective tech stack that we can afford and all works together. Yeah, and actually I recommend with smaller B2Bs not trying to find the perfect solution. If you need to drop me an email, I can probably give you more based on your situation, but there are tools that can connect with each other, but it's not necessarily one big system. And tech stack is a really common issue for marketers just figuring out what's going to be the best email platform what's going to be the best crm one thing i would say about email platform is be really careful that you don't end up buying a really expensive one when you don't actually need one and there are crm systems that have free automation now so you have to be super careful not to end up buying really expensive products damien hey how do you structure a sales team yeah interesting i did have this wild idea once that in the future will it be sales marketer this idea that you know, you've got a marketing department, the salesperson is an expert in the product and the offering, and they are, they're part of the marketing team, but they're essentially the person that comes in when someone needs to speak to somebody because all of the convincing and encouraging and nurturing should be done by marketing today. It really depends. I mean, I think that it depends on the industry. It depends on the sector. In a traditional professional services B2B company, you probably got a business development director with a few consultants reporting in and they do the meetings, the calls. It's going to be probably a lot more fancy in your sector. I know that you're in SaaS, um, but the directors aren't loving the idea of webinars. Is there an alternative idea you'd recommend to create value? So Amber, given that I know your sector and the fact that you're excited about a podcast, I think that I would have the TikTok content that you're going to be planning to do, which is basically chopping up the podcast themes into more digestible things and driving people to the podcast. Then as the next stage, I think I would be using blogs and I would be using high value reports as well and guides. So think about your target audience, what things are they getting stuck on and what things don't they understand? Rather than having a webinar, you could have something that is like state of the nation report. Here's what you need to know in this quarter. Here's what's changed in SEO. Anything that's going to be really valuable 
You could even do workbooks as well to help them get themselves set up for working well with you. Anything that's going to highlight the weaknesses of the competitors as well. I do like the idea of webinars for you guys, just because I think that the founders have got a lot of good stuff to talk about and people do get confused about the area in which you operate, but you don't have to do webinars at all. You can do high value content or you can just use the podcast to drive people in. And again, making it a video podcast later down the line, you can make sure you've got YouTube video and then clips and things like that. In B2B sales, are there any stats around how many touch points on average it takes to book a meeting demo? I could look into that. I wouldn't know off the top of my head. I'm certain that if you just Googled that, you'd find tons of things. What we talked about earlier was that people need to have had a message three to five times to really take notice. I don't know a number off the top of my head. Alex, how often do you want to be reviewing the customer journey and marketing processes on this template? I would say just get it fixed for a minute because obviously this is just a tiny part of your overall marketing plan. So then you want to have an activity plan, like an action plan on here's what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So yes, we've decided that we'd like to do a podcast and some webinars and have some high value sales literature but what are we actually going to do and how are we going to measure progress so you might start to find that actually we've looked at all the data and it turns out that people are not really engaging with this particular type of content and so we need to change it and so I would say just as and when then just review it maybe in a formal capacity every six months get the different departments together to see how all working together with that flywheel, depending on how far you go down this road. It is really just about mapping out the approach and then tweaking it as and when. I'm just going to go back to another question. Eleanor says, as a smaller business, we don't have a fully functioning slash integrating CRM, which makes it more challenging to distinguish between contact and leads and to pass the high quality leads to sales. What is your guidance? Yeah, similar to what I said earlier, it is so important to make sure that we do look at CRM and data strategy as vitally important within our growth strategies. It's not the side thing that's like, oh, we'll get to it one day. It is vital if you've got sales and marketing. And again, my CRM consultant, like he's basically my business partner he really helps people with this to make sure they've got a strategic approach to this and that you've got lead profiling and lead scoring so for example if you had an inquiry into the business you would have a system set up on the crm and this is entirely possible we've done this with people who have six people in their business you know it's not magic but it does take an expert you would look at how They are profiled. So, for example, you'd input data like number of employees, industry, likelihood to close, all these different factors, and it gives you a score. So the the lead profile score is about, like, is this going to be a good fit? So it might be 68 out of 100, and then it's, okay, this is excellent fit. So we would want to go down the path of, of working with these guys. And then you also want to do lead scoring, which is, like, based on their interactions with us, how hot are they? And then you characterize that by lead contact. It is a big piece of work, guys. I'm not going to say that it's not like that's why I don't like going into such complex models because they're just unrealistic for most businesses I would say start with getting your CRM and your data strategy in order and getting a basic bio journey in place Eleanor would love to know the CRM consultant too I'm going to tell him he's going to be getting a big head and he should because he's one he's one of the most highly regarded data consultants in the world he's absolutely incredible and it took me a long time to find him Damien if you had to choose one thing to do For better marketing in 2023, what would it be? It's like if I'd have written the question I want asked in a webinar, this would be it because it means I can say what I want to say, which is brand positioning. Why is this not talked about enough? Brand positioning. I don't think there's one single business that I have reviewed in the last eight years as a B2B marketing coach and consultant who had their brand positioning absolutely nailed without room for improvement. What is brand positioning? Brand positioning is being able to effectively articulate or rather the brand narrative brings us to life. Being able to clearly articulate, here is why you should choose us over the other options available. Let's talk about tech and SaaS companies then, Damien, because I know you're interested in these. 
most of them just say, this is the product, this does this, this solves that. They don't say why they would be better than the other options available. And they don't usually go into pain points. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of great tech companies doing it well, but I would just say in the ones I've come across, being able to get that across is just non-existent B2B in general terms. I did actually ask a really cool guy on TikTok yesterday who is a globally recognized brand strategist. And I said, why do you think no one's talking about brand positioning? And he said, because it's not taught in schools. It's not, it's not like part of the strategic process that, that is really talked about when people are being educated. That's so interesting, so true. It's the most fascinating area of, of B2B marketing for me. Are there any brands, in my opinion, that have really nailed their brand positioning that we can all go look at? I genuinely... I'm going to struggle off the top of my head because it's really hard being put on the spot to figure out which ones are really great. But there's examples of ones I've worked on in one of my webinar replays. So if you go to the YouTube channel or just click the link in my bio where it says webinar replays and you'll be able to see a webinar I did that literally explains in depth what is brand positioning and here's how the process works. And here's some examples, but I will give you a quick example of one that I did just in the last minute that we have, we had a company called Calibro Consultants and they are planning consultants in the construction industry. And just really briefly, they told us that their customers care about relationships. And I was like, well, the thing is, if someone hasn't already got a relationship with you, they're not going to realize that having a relationship with you is what sets you apart because they haven't got a relationship with you yet. So that's definitely not your key point of differentiation. When we did insight work with their ideal clients, the people that have actually buyed from them and actually love them, they were like, what I love about this company is that in a room full of really difficult decision makers around a table deciding on whether we can build a big cinema complex, they take out that complexity. They get our project over the line. They make it happen. And so we came up with Calibro consultants, all systems Calibro, like all systems go. And it was like, if you want to get your project, the green light, we specialize in X, Y, Z. And it was that kind of flipping on the head of just saying we're experts. We've been going this long, just a really simple explanation of that. There's quite a few I've worked on dozens, in fact, and every time they're just a joy and a pleasure. Definitely something that we're struggling to pull together at the moment. Yeah, no, most are. And uh, Michaela's just sent one fluent.io let's have a look at this one and i can do a little audit on it stop losing deals when you're not in the room okay create and sell with a committed champion for every deal in your pipeline so it's off to a good start what we need to find out is why are they going to be better than the other options available but it's a i love this brand it's a lovely looking site and they're definitely talking more about the benefit of the outcome of working with them, what we would need to then further understand is, are other people able to promise that? And how are they making sure that they are definitely the ones who would be better? Really nice brand though. I love the colors. Oh my gosh, I want that for myself. Amazing. Do you know, guys, I was actually thinking of doing a brand positioning audit session. So if anyone would find that interesting, you could submit to me your company and I will audit it and review it on a live session. I think that could be really interesting for people. I haven't actually got a topic for the next webinar yet, so we could do that. Oh, hey, hey, Sandy. It's so nice to see you here. I met you on, I met you on Instagram. Hi from, hi to South Africa. My best friend lives in South Africa. I have a lot of love. Okay. Hello, I just got my first marketing job. Do you have any advice? They want me to make a strategy. Well, if it's your first marketing job, I'm just answering someone on TikTok. If it's your first marketing job, you shouldn't be responsible for strategy. So that's where you're going to struggle. What I would suggest is have a listen to some of my podcast episodes on how to create a marketing strategy. The link is in my bio and you can have a look at that and that should help you with what is involved in strategy. It's really tricky. If you're a one person marketing team, you're going to have difficulty doing this alone. You could suggest to your directors that you hire maybe a marketing consultant coach or somebody who's a fractional CMO who can come in and help you put that together. I know that's difficult and I know that's not the advice that you want, but sometimes that is what it takes. Damien, live audits, you have your webinar topics for the next 12 months. Yeah, Damien, that's what I love about these sessions is 
we always get loads of ideas for the type of content that you guys want next. So like this one was born from a lot of people asking about the buyer journey. I love how interactive this session has been. Thank you, Jade. Oh, thanks so much. So make sure you sign up to the next webinar. If you haven't checked out my podcast yet, that's nice for you to look at in the meantime. Again, link in all my bios. Mihaela's saying, how can I email you? So a few different ways. You can drop me a message on LinkedIn, Jade Tambini. You can feel free to reply to any of the emails that I sent promoting this event. So that just replying goes to my inbox. Oh, Rakesh is here. I didn't even realize. Oh, hi, Susan. I didn't realize you were here. Excellent content, Jade. Ellie, what is your podcast called? I can't find the link. What is your YouTube account? So the podcast is called the B2B Marketing Gap. And if you go onto my TikTok profile, you will see in my link, it says podcast is the first one. And then it should also say webinar replays. Please make sure that you sign up to the next webinar. Have a lovely rest of your day.